Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we are joined by a consummate musician. This gentleman has been on the scene for over 35 years and has worked with many greats from Freddie Hubbard to Betty Carter, Tony Williams, Herbie Hancock, Dee Dee Bridgewater, and Sting, to name a few. He is a bassist, educator, and composer. Please welcome to Jazz Talk the legend himself, Mr. Ira Coleman. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Preston. Thank you for the warm welcome. Yes. Oh, man. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I'm not a composer, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you for the... <laughs> well, man, you know, I've, I've heard some of the some of the tunes that, that you played that I like, but uh, I was going to tell you, listen, thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk today. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. As I said, I've been trying to get you on for a while. Uh, and I was interested in starting, uh, Ira, uh, regarding your humble beginnings, your upbringing, your background. Now, I understand that you were born in uh, Sweden. And you lived in France for a while. And then later on, you moved to Germany. Man, you had a very busy life. Tell me about uh, growing up, you know, your family, both of your parents are artists, you know, your dad being a painter and your mother uh, being a silversmith and a designer, which is fascinating to me. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, uh, you already uh, let me segue into what you said. Yes, I was born in Sweden. My mother was Swedish um, and uh, she was a silversmith and designer. Uh, one of the first women to uh, probably the first, yes, she was the first woman to graduate from Konstfak uh, Skolan in, in Sweden, uh, mm -hmm. which is a specialized school for, for the arts and crafts, and as a silversmith. And um, she, um, at a young age, had a hard time finding a job because she was, she was very beautiful also, mm -hmm. and she was told that she would distract co-workers co and so on. This is 1948. Wow. So uh, she started her own little workshop in a little room and um, right from the beginning really didn't have the means to buy precious stones and precious metals and so on. So she would start to do uh, um, jewelry with rotten, with br brass, with wood, with glass, with uh, materials and very de decorative. and. Um, and she came up with these ingenious solutions of um, doing fastenings and locks and so on without using having to use solder because she was very often living in the hotel room and had just a little anvil between her legs and had to find ways to, to produce uh, 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 jewelry. And her jewelry was mainly made by a woman for a woman and it was very anti-status. It was, uh, you know, a lot of women were wearing diamonds and precious metals, uh, kind mm -hmm. of as a trophy to their wealthy husbands. And my mother wanted to do jewelry that women like to wear every day and wouldn't get in the way. So a lot of these, the things that she did were form-fitted and very anatomically fitting. Um, so she created a new language like that. And she's, she's, uh, she was uh, uh, decorated many times. She got a medal from, uh, from the King of Sweden. She was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art and uh, the Louvre Musée des Arts Décoratifs in France. And, um, you know, she had a stellar career and she basically worked until she passed. You know, she was one of those persons who who would work all day, come home and whip a dinner for us, like within half an hour, the kitchen was immaculate. She was cooking and cleaning right away. And then she went back to her, to her ideas and so on. She, she was passionate about her craft, uh, a real artist, an artist with an artist's mind. And uh, my father was, um, was from Baltimore. 15 uh, minutes from me, Ira. I'm 15 minutes from yes. Baltimore. So. Yes, from the 2200 block on Madison Avenue, and um, his parents were middle class. My gra grandfather, whom I never got to meet, he passed in 1954, before my birth, um, was uh, one of the co-founders co of uh, one of the first Black-owned insurance companies in mm. Virginia, and he got to head the Maryland chapter, and he was able to persuade people and families to keep their policies during the depression 
and uh, after the depression they um they they got to uh, to be uh, not wealthy but did a good living and my grandmother was a teacher so everybody in the family uh, was college educated and my father was kind of the rebel of the family um his friends were all the jazz musicians he w- went to the same high school as uh ellis larkin and uh who was a few years older and he was also um he uh, uh, you know he did world war ii and uh, he was a buffalo soldier and the 92nd um infantry um uh, regiment and um, um, was uh, wounded on the war field and had two purple heart and a bronze star and mm. came back and through the GI Bill much t- to my grandfather's demise he he uh, became an artist and uh, so he went to uh, Parsons School of Design in um, in the early 50s and um, worked there as an industrial designer at, at night he uh, took some uh, painting courses, and then in the mid '50s, um, he uh, he went to Paris because he wanted to be a painter. And if you wanted to be a painter, you went to Paris. If you wanted to be a jazz musician, you you went to New York. So, uh, so my b- father became an expatriate, you know. And my parents met in 1955 in Sweden, and very uh, soon moved down. Uh, to Paris. My mother had been in France a few times mm-hmm. since 1948. And, um, and they uh, became part of this community of expatriates and of um, uh, intellectuals and artists who were um, fighting for independence Afri- of the African colonies from France and a lot of jazz musicians, writers. Uh, Chester Hines was a personal friend of the family. Uh, my father uh, was hanging around, you know, every black person which other there, and you know, got to know Richard Wright and uh, James Baldwin and all wow. the people who would be there and the expatriate musicians like uh, Bud Powell, who would play at the oh, North. Bud Powell or at the Shaki Pesh, like for weeks, and my father would, of course, be there every night. <laughs> he told oh, me he told me a story uh you know he's like uh, he met some french friends of his and french people can be very opinionated you know they they hear one record and then they, they tell you what jazz is or what jazz isn't you know so but anyhow um not all french people but uh they have a very strong opinion so he was on the way to the shaki pesh to to listen to um to uh, uh, Bud Powell, who I think was playing there with Pierre Michelot and maybe maybe Art Taylor, Art Taylor or somebody else, Kenny Clark, maybe, you know. And um, and uh, he met some people and said, oh, Walter, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to listen to, uh, to Bud Powell. Oh, we already heard him. And my father just like told me he got so upset. He said, what are you talking about? You heard him. <laughs> You know, every note this guy plays, is, he's a genius. You have to be there every set, you know, even if he plays the same tune all over and over. So, yes, my father was a diehard uh, uh, jazz fan and, and all his friends were jazz musicians. He was very, very much, he was friends with, uh, with Max Roach. Yeah. Like, like an uncle to me. And Max used to call him a visual musician. Visual musician. That's that's beautiful, man. You know, speaking of Bud Powell, you just made me think of something. And this is probably uh, after he had the electric, you know, the shock treatments. But I spoke to uh, Roy Haynes and uh, Jimmy Heath many years ago, and they said, you know, without a doubt, Bud is the most influential pianist in jazz history. He said the whole language, you know, comes from Bud. He said, you ask McCoy Tyner, Charlie Parker, Bill Evans, all of them point to Bud. You know, yeah. uh, back in the 40s, he was just a wonder to behold. But one of the things that I found very interesting, Ira, is, uh, you know, as you said, your family uh, is connected with all these people and your dad, especially, you know, jazz. But I, I was just blown away uh, when I was reading up on you and the type of people that were coming to you around to your house. Billy Holiday, you know, uh, Louis yeah, Armstrong, mother, Charles I'm, Mingus. That's incredible. Yeah, my mother made jewelry for Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, yeah. There are even pictures of uh, Jean-Pierre Leloir in France, maybe from 1958 or 57, where she's wearing 
uh, my mom's jewelry. And my mom said, you see that mic there? They had a short, I had to go out there and, and twirl the, 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 the cables together, you know, for it to work. <laughs> you know, <so>. oh. <laughs> and Billy, Billy passed away, I think in 59. You don't probably remember, you were probably too young to remember her coming by, uh, weren't you? You know, cause I guess what you were. I, you I, were... I, I was too young. We, I have a letter that uh, she sent to my parents. I mean, you can see it's addre addressed seven West 76th Street or something oh, like wow. that on the Upper West Side. Um, uh, uh, I have it. I have a picture somewhere. That's inc uh, that's incredible. Yeah, you, you uh, have all that stuff. I like the story that I uh, read. Like you talked about uh, Mingus pulling all this money or something out of his shoe. You know, yeah, he kept cash on kid. him. Was, we, we were in Marseille, and he was on tour with. Mm -hmm. um, I think Abby was in that band, and I definitely remember Eric Dolphy because Eric Dolphy, yeah. Uh, he he. Uh, we went to this Luthier, and 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 Mingus bought a bass, mm -hmm. and when it came time to pay, uh, he took his shoe off and took like a large dollar bills out from inside of under. <laughs> I thought that was like a spy, you know, <laughs> and and paid the guy for money from his shoe. I never, I mean, I mean, how old was that? Ten years old or something like that. And uh, so he took the base, and then we went back to the hotel. And then he was walking on the on on the Place de la Canebière, which is the uh, and 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 Eric Dolphy just happened to work play there, and he just took up the bass and started playing the bass in the park. I mean, you, can you imagine as a kid, it was just like, I was like, oh, I, at one time he stayed like a week at our house and he was trying to lose weight. So my mother had, I think, one of those first brown juicers, you know, where you put vegetable in for, for a whole week, all uh, my mom was telling me all he ate, all he drank was vegetable juice. Like she just, yeah, like like in the magic bullet, or like one of those Nutri bullets. Uh, no, like one of those juice expresses. You know, oh, I got you. Okay, you know, centrifugal. One of those, yeah. one of the first in the sixties. My mom. That's had, an, that's uh, incredible. A German one. Yeah, um, it's and you know I have a memory of waking up and there's there's Louis Armstrong look at me, looking at me, you know, and or. You know, like my father, of course, up to like a few years ago, every now and then I would meet people and say, oh, yeah, I've been to your parents' house. Like like the first time I played with um, Clifford Jordan, he said, yeah, I've been to your house. And then the next time he came with some Polaroid pictures that he had of my family in my house mm. you know, in, the, in the 60s where he was, he was on tour with Mingus, I think, you know, in Europe. And uh, well, uh, you know, the, all of the whole Basie band came to the to the to the garden, and and, and my father made a barbecue that like roasted the whole lamb, you know, with an Algerian friend of his who was mm. you know how to do that. And um, another time, I mean, Ray Charles was coming. I, I got some pictures of Ray and and the Raylets and uh, and. Uh, 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 who was Hank Crawford was in the band Crawford. In, in the band and David Newman remember you know David Crawford. Fathead Newman yeah yeah I got yeah. to play with him he, yeah so it was, it, it was nice and my father at one point he was doing there was a guy in American I think he was American Eddie Barkley mm -hmm. who was an uh, uh he had this record a company in France called Barkley or another one called Riviera and he was based in Nice in or, or on the French Riviera and his wife was Nicole Buckley, who became like the godmother for my one of my sisters. And my father was, um, he was uh, doing the artwork for imports of jazz records. So we got all these, you know, like I remember my father making a cover for Ole uh, from Train. Nicole Train. Uh, yeah, yes. so I'm... I, I'm I'm like he's listening to the music while he's making it, and I'm no I I see my father drawing, so I decide to draw, and you know I made this drawing of like I think I had a guy with a guitar I don't know why I put a guitar and but I had two basses 
you know, and a saxophone player. And so my father asked, uh, um, why are you drawing two bases? And I said, Dad, there are two bases. And sure enough, you know, there's Reggie Workman and Jimmy Garrison on that record. And so I, I'm just saying just that as an anecdote, you know, that I, I was attracted to the bass. And my mom said that when she was pregnant with me, all she was listening to was uh, Oscar Pettiford and Paul James. Mm, so, wow. You know, she loved the bass and, you know, she loved Mingus and, you know. Yeah. Interesting. Now, Ira, do you think you eventually gravitated toward that? Because interestingly enough, you didn't pick up a bass until late teens or close to when you were 20 years old. That's kind of late, you know, for starting. But do you think all those years of maybe uh, being around maybe at Mingus, uh, you're, you know, listening to bass and, uh, you know, your dad painting and, you know, you're talking about that. You think that had an effect on you? Or like, you know, maybe I'll, I'll play this. This fits my personality. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up listening to jazz. The most commercial music we listened at home was Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. My father discovered Ray Charles while he was living in Europe, you know, because when he lived in 1955, I guess he didn't know of him. And, you know, and he loved the blues players also like Sleepy John Estes and Big Bill Brunzi and, um, you know, uh, Lightning Hopkins and Lead Belly and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, who sang, um, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, get back. Um, Big Bill Brunzi, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that was his song, you know. Um, so, and, and my father was listening to that all the time, you know. Mm. Or, you know, like I remember being a kid and listening to, you know, uh, Oscar Brown Jr.'s um, yeah, Oscar Brown, uh, yeah. so, uh, Sin and Soul, that record. Mm -hmm. And they, they, there's, there's, a, there's a song he does like, bid him in, bid him in, bid him in. You know, it's like an auction, a slave auction. Mm -hmm. I, I remember listening to that and it was like, you know, or... And just the, you know, a signifying monkey and yeah, signifying monkey. Know, I was, yeah. I was like, as a kid, I hardly spoke any in English, but it made a big <laughs> impression on me that record. Right, you know? <laughs> right. Now, I was going to ask you. I guess uh, you know when you picked up the bass and started playing. Eventually, what you went to uh, a university when you were in Germany for a while. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, like you were saying, playing music was just like a soul searching thing for mm -hmm. me. You know, it was like. Unfortunately, my parents separated when I was 10 years old and, and it's hard on kids. You know, oh. I look at pictures of me at being 10 years old and then suddenly I look sad, you know, you just, as a kid, you know, being from a broken home is, is hard. And mm -hmm. my parents, uh, things weren't good, well, going well between them. So they put me in a, in a, in a boarding school and that was, it was very lonely. And then one day suddenly I came home and my father was gone. And it was hard. And then two years later, my mother couldn't stand to be, you know, there where she had been happy and, and with my dad. So she decided to move away, to move away. Also, as a silversmith, she had a, had an employer with a, 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 a workshop with six to seven employees and, you know, making payroll and doing like, you know, uh, Christmas uh, uh, orders like 50 times the same, same necklace and so on. It became, it became really uh, hard, you know. And and then the the Dan the Royal uh, Danish um, uh, Silver Miss um, George Jensen approached mm -hmm. her, and and basically overtook all her collection, and so she could concentrate on just doing prototypes and small, small series if she wanted to. to and she didn't need a big workshop anymore. Yeah. Um, and she needed to, to be on a regular basis to, to in Denmark. And she had met these people in Germany and Denmark was like about three hours drive from, from where she had met these people. And, uh, and being a single mother, it would have been nice to have friends. And so much to my demise, as you can say, you know, at 12 years old, I left the French Riviera to live in, in Lower Saxony in the air, yeah. and over in, in Germany, in Wolfsburg, which is the, 
the 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 industrial city where forty five thousand people at that time went into the Volkswagen works to make cars. So, uh, but you know, as a kid, you're very adaptable. So I, I basically learned. I was just at the age where you can learn a language fluently, and from one day to the other, I had to speak German. So within a year, I was totally fluent, and in high school there. So I um, I did my high school basically from age twelve to to nineteen in in Germany. It is it's seven years. I did that in Germany, and then I stayed until I was twenty six. And um, um, so. At that time, my mother had moved away. She she tended to live like 10, 12 years in every country so that she chose to stay. She moved to uh, Southeast Asia, to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. While I was actually doing my military service at that time, I had a French passport. So <laughs> I did my military service in the French Marines artillery as a, as a pointer on a 155 millimeter howitzer. You know, mm. <laughs> that was my job yeah. for a year. You know, I was drafted. And then after that, I uh, I didn't know what to do with my life. So uh, I had started to, to play some music and I auditioned at the Cologne Conservatory, Cologne University of Music. And much to my surprise, I got accepted, you know. Awesome. So uh, I was self-taught at that time. So actually my... My serious studying career started at age 22. No. 22. Wow. That, that's amazing. I mean, like I said, that's late for a bass player. Now, I understand that you uh, had a friend, and I think what you guys had a discussion or started talking about jazz, and maybe he mentioned Berkeley to you, and uh, you made the move over to the United States. And uh, I guess your dad, as you said, was friends with Max Roach. So you called up Max, and you ended up staying with him uh, when you made the move uh, to go to Berkeley. Yes, uh, uh, I had a roommate in in Cologne um, who had been an exchange student mm -hmm. uh, with a family in Boston. Actually, the family was a nurse, and the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, one of the uh, colleagues of that nurse was Abe Laboyel's wife, and Abe Laboyel was uh, living in Boston at that time. So my friend took even a lesson with him, you know. Wow. And he went to uh, Pooh's pub and listened to some music and listened to, I think it was Mike Stern in 1977 or something like that. Uh, uh, and uh, he said, so, and he, uh, he went to a Berkeley camp in the summer, I think 78 or 77. So when I met him in 79, he said, uh, 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 no, it, bef just before I went to the Cologne in 79, uh, oh, I had just started there because I started in the winter of 77. In the summer of 79, I went to the States because I had never met my father's family. Oh. I had never been to the States. You know? wow. I had not met anybody from my father's family. Mm -hmm. So... That's why I was mentioning a little earlier that it was kind of soul searching. To me, the music was uh, representing my father's world. Right. And from age 10, my father, my father was, was in my life again and uh, anymore. Um, we moved to Germany. I didn't see him for seven years, you know. So um, my parents were estranged. And uh, uh, so I seeked him out. You know, in 75, I went to Paris to see him and I, I continued to visit him regularly while I was in the army. I would go to his house uh, on leave uh, on the weekends. And um, um, so when I went to uh, uh, study in, 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 in Germany in 79, I decided to go to the States. Mm. And... Um, so I went to Baltimore, I went to New York, I went, I went to see my aunt who lived on Fifth Avenue in, in, um, in uh, uh, like around 110th Street in New York. And then I went down to, to Baltimore and, and met my father's aunt, so my great aunt and her sister. Uh, so that was my grandmother's sister. Mm -hmm. And other relatives that I had, cousins, and I had the greatest time 
you know, it was, it was hot there and it was, it was just great, you know, to be finally, you know, uh, it's, you know, growing up in France, it was great. I mean, a lot of my, my, uh, I had a diverse community. I had Italian friends, I had North African friends, African friends and so on. But in Germany, it was pretty homogenous, like uh, yeah. uh, German. So it was great. You know, that was my introduction to uh, to African-American culture, really. Like, mm -hmm. kind of try, trying to trace the footsteps of my dad. And yeah. so that planted the seed. And uh, a couple of years before that, I had met Max was on tour in 1977, and I hung out with him. And he was like, uh, and I said, you know, I'm just starting. I played bass in high school. I would love to play some music, you know. Uh, and uh you know I'm, I'm 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 getting ready to go to university here and so on he said no if you want to come to the states i'm a professor at, at umass in amherst and you know just come by you can stay with me and it's it's easy i, I can introduce you you know um, because my uh, my fear was like you know you go to america everybody is a monster there and every because that was you know, it's like, who am I? I'm in Europe. Right. You know, I've, I don't, I, I, I have the affinity. I have maybe the taste for the music, but I don't know how to play it. I've never really played with anybody. I, you know, I know a few songs. I'm trying on my own to piece things together, but, you know, so, you know, I try to, uh, to study as much as possible. So I went to visit him in 79. I stayed the summer there with him and I got to meet, meet his friend Raul his son and uh the the uh, uh, and all the players from his percussion ensemble you know he max was living up uh in connecticut in greenwich connecticut and then he had this big house who had belonged to i guess one of the daughters of the rothschilds you know he was like a mm. and uh he uh, he was uh it was a house on shady lane i think it's called um and in the basement he had all these uh, uh, percussion instruments from Ludwig, you know, like, and Musser and, you know, it, marimbas, uh, uh, vibes, timpanis, anything you can imagine, you know, and so all the guys were there, like, I got to meet Joe Chambers and, yeah, Chambers. and, and um, Roy Brooks and Omar mm -hmm. uh, Clay and Warren Smith and Ray Montilla and all the, the guys who played with him, and it, it was wonderful. I even drove a a, 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 a track, a truck to to uh, to JFK. They were going to Perugia, and 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 Raúl was going to be their their road manager. And I, we drove this truck there to the freight airport, and then I had to drive it back to the. I mean, it was it was so much fun. So I was like, man, I got to come back here. And so uh, I applied to Berkeley. Uh, like in 1980 and um, my, my roommate had been at Berkeley and he's like man you should go and you know like, why don't you go there and so I did and um, and I ended up staying in the states since 19 since the fall of 1982 you know so incredible yeah. I was going to ask you Ira uh, you know being with Max spending time with him what do you what do you think you learned uh, from being around, you know, someone like that, because, you know, of course, he's a giant in the music world. But what were some of the lessons that he taught you when you were with him? Well, it was Uncle Max, you know. Uncle Max, okay. He he knew me since I was newborn, basically, or six months old. I was like when he first came to the house, you know. As a matter of fact, he said, you know, I, I at six, eight months, I used to sit at the beach and just watch the waves for 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 like half an hour or 20 minutes and and max told me we thought something might be wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> if you he heard me now he's like man i can't i can't shut him up you know this guy is like talking a mile a minute right. so no as a as a kid i was very you know i was and I, I, I can be very much like that, very much in my own world, you know, my, mm -hmm. my, my wife can attest to that. <laughs> I have that from my mom, I think. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, where was I? So uh, Max uh, 
well, Max, first of all, he was meticulous. I mean, you you went to his house, like uh, or his apartment, or when I saw him in in New York, he had, you know, he had an apartment on Central Park West, 415 Central Park West since the 60s, you know, I think or early 70s, and I think Charles Tolliver stayed there from for uh, many years uh, while he was living up in Connecticut and so on. But I, that apartment was huge. You know, it's like two apartments on the floor, kind of like where Ron Carter lives. You know, you, you know, you open up as half the floor of the building is your apartment, <laughs> you know, one of those. <laughs> so, yeah, you can have pool tables and whatever in the rooms. I mean, it's galore. There's like service, servant quarters in the back of the kitchen. And I mean, like, you know, that kind of, kind of a place, Central Park West, you know. So he had that for decades and uh, the place was immaculate, you know, uh, 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 you know, Max loved to have things clean. And to me, that was very indicative to the way he made music and the way he was, yeah. everything was very clean. His business was very clean. Mm -hmm. And when things didn't go his, his way, he, he got in quite some fits, you know, he, he had, quite a temper you know and i i got i got to be on the other end of that and it, i tell you it's it's it was scary it was scary <laughs> you know but he was right he was right you know uh, so yeah i uh, disciplined he was very disciplined you know always immaculate well dressed and and um yeah a, a, a total gentleman you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah Cl class act man one of, one of the greats class act. Yeah. yeah. Now, after you left Berkeley, I guess you're on the New York scene. I think one of the first people you played with was Archie Shep, if I'm not mistaken. Archie right? Shep. I was still at Berkeley and yeah. his son, Pavel, came up to me, who was a drummer. and was like, hey, you know, my dad is looking. He's always looking for a young musician. Why don't you go and audition? I said, uh, what, where, where is your dad? Well, he's at UMass in Amherst. I said, how do I get there? Well, there's a Peter Pan bus, a trailways bus you can take. So I went out there and I auditioned. I played, you know, is that what you want to play? And I said, you know, he played a few tunes. He played, you know, in a sentimental mood and giant steps and so on. He said, okay. So I went back and um, while I was still at Berkeley one day, he called me and he said, listen, I got a gig in, in Montreal at the Rising Sun for Dudu Boissel. And he said, yeah, it's quartet. It's going to be with you, uh, with Boogaloo, uh, with Marvin Smith and Kenny Werner. So, mm. so this is in like 1984, 83, maybe even. Mm -hmm. So I went out there, but he's like, you know, it pays, it pays four hundred dollars, and you got to pay your own, your own train out there and your own hotel and so on. I was like, at that point, I didn't, I didn't care. You know, uh, Archie was pretty tight with the money. You know, as a matter right. of fact, John, John Batch told me they, they used to call him Archie Cheap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, you know? man. So, uh, uh, so, um, so I went up there and at first I, I, I couldn't get over the border. And then, you know, because I had a base and Canadian customs are like, what are you going to do there? You don't have a work permit and said, well, it's waiting at the other end. And sure enough, you know, Dudu was there when we got there. Of the night, we took the night all to Montreal, and uh, mm. it, it was incredible. The first time, so I play with him, and we play giant steps at really fast tempo, wow. and he plays the head, and then he disappears like for fifteen minutes. You know, and it's like Kenny is like wheeling and dealing, and like hanging in there with Boogaloo is like all over, right? <laughs> all over. And Boogaloo seemed to be living on 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 on. Uh, you know, he's tried to shakabuku me. He was living on chanting cigarettes mm -hmm. and coffee. You know, he was like this. And I'd never seen the people, that person, that song was so much energy. It was like, yeah. almost like with playing with Elvin. I mean, it was, it was incredible. I mean, can you, can you imagine you, you still have student and you get to play with these people? I mean, I, I would have paid anybody just to do that, you know? So uh, I still had an aunt, one of my mother's, sisters emigrated to Canada in 1948 actually to Montreal and she was living out in the country and she had a she had a a, a, a friend who 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 let me stay with her so I didn't have to pay hotel which was nice you know and mm. yeah yeah that's out, great man hanging out uh, with 
with, I love with, with <laughs> Archie. And Archie was a historian, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. he told me, you know, you know, uh, you know, in, in Florida, you know, the Seminoles, you know, and the Native Native Americans are, are technically still at war. They never signed a peace, uh, you know, Chief Osceola, he never signed a peace treaty, you know. So I was like, oh, really? You know, I'm, I'm in, in school and he's giving me lessons about American history. And, you know, it's it, it wonderful. You know, I mean, I learned so much from from these people about m music, about, you know, like, I mean, Archie, I mean, music is, is not music. Music is his life. It just permeates yeah. everything, you know. And everything. Guys yeah. like that, it's like, okay, it's not about notes. It's about, you don't talk about music. You just feel it or you don't, you know. And that led me, all of that. Then when I first left Berkeley, then my first major gig was with the, with, uh, with uh, um, Freddie Hubbard, you know. And I was about Freddie to ask Hubbard. you about that. Yeah, I was about to ask you about that, Ira. How did you uh, hook up with him? I mean, after playing with Archie, how did you, you know, meet Freddie, and uh, how did that whole thing begin? Well, I I went to Berkeley two years, from fall of '82 to fall of '84, but I still needed some some uh, uh, credits, you know. So in the summer of what was it, 85, I think, or 84? Uh, well, you know, Berkeley gives you like a summer, full credit at sum, summer semester. So in two years, two cal calendar years, I actually did six semesters. Okay. You know, I never took a break. I, I, the break that I had, I, I went to play in a club or in Martha's Vineyard, you know, when mm -hmm. people were drinking milk. <laughs> There's no booze on Martha's Vineyard, you know. So yeah. <laughs> It's like what? What is this? Anyhow, so uh, 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 so I, I was short a few credits, so I went back. But so for a hot second, I, I, I uh, in the fall of '84, I moved down to New York, and I was staying with Scott Robinson and and Neil Slandoki and uh, Terry Lynn was in that same building also. And um, yeah, Terry Lynn moved out, and I actually moved into a room with Neil Slandoki, the pianist, okay. Okay. and. And Scott Robinson was upstairs. I had a room with him for a short while with my girlfriend. And um, so um, I, I got to gig around somehow. And uh, uh, I played, you know, Ronnie Matthews got me a few gigs. He was really helpful. James Williams, who I had met. In, oh, he and his James Williams. I mean, James knew everybody who, who was doing what and always hiring young musicians. It was like, it was just a darling. I mean, I was, it was, he was just, uh, James had the biggest heart you can imagine, you know, and always out to help people, you know. So I, I had really, I met some nice people. So through, I think through Ronnie, uh, I got a gig with, uh, at LC's Lounge in Newark mm. with, um, with uh, um, Steve Touré. Yeah. Oh, Carl. Yeah, Carl, Carl, you know, uh, Steve Touré. Carl was on the gig, uh, Carl Allen and Mulgrew. Mulgrew Miller, yeah. Mulgrew Miller. So Mulgrew, uh, you know, after the gig or a couple of days later, it's like, uh, Aaron, what are you doing? I would love to use you on my record. So I'm like, really? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my first record as a leader um, and I want to use you and Smitty. And mm -hmm. not, you know, like the choice that people, you know, everybody was either using, you know, you know, Kenny Barron, Billy Hart, um, Buster Williams, that that was like uh, Ray Drummond. And so the guys yeah. who would be like doing all said, you know, I want to use some young people, my contemporaries. So would you like to do it? I said, wow. So he sent me the music. And at that time, yeah, in the summer I was up in Boston, so I, I practiced the music. It was, and then I came back to New York and we did the recording like in in six hours. It's called Keys to the City. And to this day, I still like listening to it. Usually mm -hmm. it, it took me about 25 years to really, to, to listen to what I, I've done or recorded as people recorded without cringing, you know, I mean, I. I I had the t I've had the tendency to be really very self-critical, 
and this is not just in music but in general you know it's um it's something that that i'm that i'm working on you know it's it's also brought me to where i am you know because i i i get nervous before every gig almost and i hear that from musicians so I, all the time yeah yeah and i so i try to leave uh, uh no st stone on turn so i i try to be on time i try to be to dress correctly to make sure my equipment is working to make sure that i've practiced the music and so on not to be like sweating bullets on the stage and and then you know um uh, thinking, you know, I, wishing I had done this, I would have sounded better. So, uh, you know, this, it's, it's been like that for many years. And uh, it's funny, I have a few colleagues who feel like that. I mean, Billy Drummond and I would be like that, you know, back yeah. in the day where we would like, oh man, man, if I wish that, <laughs> man, I, oh, I was, man, I, I didn't. So yeah. I try yeah. to be out of it. I, I've I'm much better this way, and I'm 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 very proud and and very happy and, and I feel very fortunate to have played with all the people that I have played and to to have had you know um, you know my my mother was kind of uh, was the kind of person who had to fight in her life as a woman mm. you know, to get what she wanted to do. She would come with her. You know, see somebody with a project and and get thrown out and come back through the back door and it's like you know insistent. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, She's very self-promoting and you know I don't have that that confidence that she had. So she would say, you know, oh, you know, you know, Mill Jackson, Art Taylor, you know, Mingus, all these people. They've been they're friends of the home. Just when you're in New York, just go and knock and uh, on their door and say you want a gig. And I said. Uh, no, mom. no, 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 I don't do that. I just, I don't, I don't knock on somebody's door and I'm not ready, you know, and I'm going to look like a fool. So, you know, I used to go and listen to Monty Alexander all the time. I loved that trio with John Clayton and yeah. Jeff Hamilton. And I took lessons with, with John Clayton. And at one point, John is like, hey, would you like to play with Monty? Mm. I, I, I say, could I? Would I like to play with Monty? You know, yeah, of course. Uh, but you know, why didn't you say so? I said, "Well, you're the bass player with him. I'm not going to go and ask you or him." You know, replay. Well, you should be more aggressive. You should be more assertive. I said, yes, um, you're right. I should be more assertive, but I feel very uncomfortable doing that. I know, I know what you're saying. I know Monty is calling me and said, you know, John, it's recommended you. You know, can you play with me in Atlanta with Smitty? So that's it. And then for 12 years, I I, uh, I played with him. You know, it's like uh, not as a as a regular member because Monty was using many people. And then and uh, after 20 years, almost we're playing together again he calls me for things it, it's so much fun you know that's incredible man I, I i love hearing these stories i wanted to ask you about betty carter what was that experience like working with someone like her because i've talked to so many uh, musicians uh from cyrus chestnut uh and uh, others lewis nash who work with her and they said in the beginning it was quite frightening you know betty is uh you know it's like she's an institution herself and learning from her you know, you get so much, but I, I she, uh, she liked you. I uh, read a quote. She said something about you, about having the, uh, the skills and uh, the attitude. You're going to go places or you got, you know, you can do a lot of different things, but uh, what was it like working with Betty, man? Um, you, you're quite right in what you were saying. Betty was an institution. Yeah. You know, Betty was born in 1929 or 27. So she was my mom's age, you know, and um uh but she didn't have it she did it wasn't easy for her you know i mean her first gig was with major gig was with lionel hampton and lionel would fire her you know mm. she was in tears and then went to lionel's wife gloria and it was like you could fire me and she and lionel hampton's wife was like don't, don't worry about that you know you know you, you you're fine you know so um so she was old school, you know, and uh, 
she started back car in the 70s you know nobody wanted to record her or what she wanted to do so she started her own record label and you know she was a strong woman you know and uh, uh quite stern and quite um with very strong convictions to be polite and uh uh and and very hard on her musicians especially bass players i mean you know you like you know her you know her first tune would be like you know like we like this you know like turn around like for like bass in her and she would she would be like ah! you know and then singing about it, and you're like you're like and, and then she would turn around it's like on top on top you know it's like you know? so you couldn't slack you know you could never tell her that you had a cold or something if you had a cold she would work you twice as hard you know and she you know she always had like if you listen to her song tight it's always about oh, yeah. four and you know and playing the anticipated one and being really in time and it's got a swing and her time was perfect you know okay. when she when she played a ballad you know it, it was <laughs> sometimes you know i mean she would be with the lyrics like half a bar a bar late you know like we used to play uh uh, uh every time we say goodbye and and um uh, i didn't know the song very well so she had an arrangement that um, John Hicks had done for her, but um, the piano player and I, I think Daryl Grant at that time, we didn't really know well the tune. And mm -hmm. so she sang the harmony, she sang the melody legit the way it was written with, with the, the standard harmonies. And then, you know, uh, so, and then, you know, the, the, the place in the lyric where, uh, the lyric goes from major to minor and 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 the chord really goes from major to minor you know yeah well yeah. you know by the time she came to that spot that that place had gone by already half a bar you know so it was more it was like i don't know it was augmented yeah. and diminished not major to minor you know <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, Betty. So Betty she would float over it. I mean, her time. But you know, when she slapped her finger, when she snapped her fingers, or she used to say, you know, watch my ass for the time. You know, and sure enough, you know, the way she would move, you knew this is where the time was. You know. Right. Right. And, wow. And, and the other guy like that was like, you know, perfect living time. It's like Ray Charles. You know. When he says Georgia and his foot comes down, you know that's where the one is. Yeah, and well, everything is on the one. Yeah, <laughs> total groove, totally. And you know that marks you as a young musician up to this day. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anybody who has played with uh, Betty Carter ever from the time she used what from Lyle Atkinson to over, you know. You know Jack to Jeanette and 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 Billy Hart and Buster and whoever Cliff Barbaro, you know uh, Kenny Washington, uh, uh, Louis Nash, yeah, uh, Greg Hutchinson, Winard Harper, any of these drummers of and then and Stephen Scott and Hicks and any of these rhythm players that I would play with, I have a instant instant hook up i have a, i have a pocket that i can go to Any and didn't one uh, of those didn't you know. winard harper give you some advice i think you were playing with betty one time and winard said something to you because you were i guess maybe uh trying to i guess maybe figure things out he gave you some advice yes. I, I i was like very serious taking things serious but the, because you know when when you have one beat coming down and you need to be on and I was like left the beat behind the beat before under the beat over the beat anywhere but where there you know it's 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 something that you have to learn you know or like medium tempos like I call them old man's tempos you know they're like hard to play you know it's easier to play fast and you know like you know think from bar A to bar B or from 
from bar, you know, four bar down and somehow make the time, even if you're missing notes. But right. with every note in the ballad, where the time is so slow that you have the impression it's coming to a stand till still. It's almost like Zen. Every note is like counts, not only where you put the music, the note down, but how long your note lasts. It defines the rhythm that you're playing, you know. So uh, I was super hard try to figure it out, you know, uh, locking with a drummer, locking with her, the piano, find my place, be mm -hmm. assertive at the same time, choose the right note, the right intonation. Uh, you know, so I and uh, I would make mistakes, you know, and Betty would pull me in and said, you know, it's, you know, you know, you're making mistakes. What, what am I going to do with you? And I said, you know, Betty, um, I'm really as honestly, I'm giving you my best. If my best is not good enough for you, I understand, you know, but I'm not taking this uh, lightly. So I hear you, but uh, I know. I'm trying to rectify, I'm working on it, you know. I said, okay, okay, you know. So, because she was very strict, you know. And But um, she liked you. She liked you because of just that nice compliment I, that she paid you about your skills and your attitude. So there was something in you that she must have really liked and saw potential. Well, at that time, she Betty wasn't the kind of person who would give you, uh, you know, the, the louange, how do you say, to compliments or a positive reinforcement or so, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Winard, at that time, I mean, I think his idol was, was Billy Higgins. Yeah, Billy Higgins. And yeah. Billy Higgins was a joy to listen to, a joy to watch, always smiling. I mean, just like, almost, it felt like, you know, I've come through so much shit and, you know, so much adversity and, you know, I could be somewhere else, you know, now I'm going to enjoy whatever I'm doing, you know, and then sure enough, I mean, what a musician. And we not just idolized uh, 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 Billy Higgins. So he came up to me and, and gave me the best advice ever anybody has given me. He said, you know, Ira, I see you out there, man. You need to condition yourself to have fun. You know, you need to condition yourself to enjoy what I'm you're doing otherwise you're not gonna last and it's totally true in this business you're not gonna last if you if you hard on yourself negative about everything you need to find joy in what you're doing music is hard you're always going to find somebody who who does things that you wish you could or who are which are intimidating to you or which make you feel like you you, you ain't worth shit, you know. So yeah, uh, it, and and you know, and they keep getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. I but, hear you. You know, I got a story to say in my way, and yeah. I do it my way. And some people like I like to compliment people. I like to be a team player, and um, you know, I'm glad I chose the bass as hard as the bass and uh, is to play. Uh, it's it's gotten me to to play with incredible people, you know, and sure has, there's man. only one in, in, in the band. And I love to compliment. I love to give big fat notes on the bottom and, yeah. and, and, you know, inspire people. And that's what I do 95% of the time or 98% of the time. And then every now and then a little solo, you know, so. You do it well, man. You <laughs> I'm do that well, kind man. of a bass player. Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you uh, about Tony Williams uh, uh, and go back a little bit even before then. Uh, Billy Pierce, uh, the saxophonist who was in that quintet, who was a, a sort of a mentor for you, I guess, when you were at Berkeley. And uh, was he re instrumental in getting you in that band or how did you uh, get to work with t the great late Tony Williams? Yes. Um, so let's backtrack. I so I'm at Berkeley and I get to meet Billy. I had seen him as a music musical director with uh with uh art blakey you know mm -hmm. i had seen him with art blakey um maybe david schneider of charles farmbro and james and bobby watson yeah and i think it was valerie ponomarioff uh or maybe terence mm, i can't remember i've i've seen so many 
I so many different people with art, you know, like from, you know, for a hot second, Walter Davis was back in the band. Walter Davis, and, yeah. And then he, Bill Hardman, and that mm-hmm. band I saw him with, with the trumpeter, uh, yeah, Bill I Hardman, think, yeah. Yeah, with Dave Schneider and and uh, I think Dennis was on bass already. Dennis Irwin. And then I saw, yeah, I saw with Valerie and uh, Johnny O'Neill mm. and and James. Uh, and then the, in New York, then with uh, Jean Toussaint and Tim Bone, and uh, you know. Uh, Donald Harrison and Terrence and Classico yeah. and Mulgrew. I mean, who? I mean, I think tens of musicians. You know that that R. Blakey. I never got to play with him, but that would have been great. You know. But anyhow, uh, so Bill is uh, was at Berkeley since the seventies. You know, up until recently when he retired. I think he put thirty five or forty years in into and became the head of the press support of the uh, uh, Reeds Woodwinds, you know. Uh, but at that time, uh, he um, he was full time and um, he um, he got, I think I took an ensemble, the music of Art Blakey with him. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I did that and then he called me for a gig uh, uh, or James, James and him James, him, Alan Dawson, and I, you know, was like, that was like my first gig in Boston, you know, with Alan Dawson. I mean, oh. it was nice, nice. It was at the English Museum for, for uh, uh, a, a, a group of high school kids. I remember I was like, in, incredible. There was like security officers checking for weapons and stuff. I was like, what the hell? What's going on? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Great, great. Anyhow, uh, so um, uh, we stayed in touch, and I, 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 I always I played with him many times at the Willow at Riles, you know, because then I started gigging locally in the in the years that I was there at Berkeley in the two and a half years. So I got to play with Billy many times, and uh, so after doing that gig with Steve Touré, Carl Allen, um, you know, so Mo- I did the record with Mulgrew and Carl Allen when they called me and said, you know, Freddie is putting a band together or I am actually the straw boss and uh, I'm putting a band of young musicians together. I want you, I want Kenny Garrett and Donald Brown. So that was, that was my first gig out of, out of college, mm. 80, 85, you know, so I went, you know, knowing all the stories about Freddie, I went to Billy and Billy was like, um, I said, I give me some advice playing with Freddie. You know, how do I keep, keep well, you know, the music is, it's, this is high, uh, how do you say high exposure, you know, this is, I mean, I'm just basically out of college playing with Freddie Hubbard. I'm like, yeah, at that time there was, it was Freddie, Woody Shaw, Dizzy, and and Winton was coming up. I mean, those were like the, the biggest trumpet players, you know, which come to my mind, you know, the most. And yeah, I mean, Miles was still alive, but I mean, playing straight ahead and stuff, you know. Right. So I'm like, uh, yeah. And Freddie was in his prime at that time, you know. Uh, so he's like, you know, whatever you do, uh, Billy was like, whatever you do, you know, just stay private, you know, don't hang out with him. <laughs> That's advice, you know, you know, don't, don't try to hang with him and so on. Just, just be about the music and, you know, be, you know, and, you know, he's, he's the band leader, you know, treat him as don't get involved in people's that. personal business, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, don't bug him too much, you know, don't, you know, just then, then he'll leave you alone if you start, you know, showing cracks, you know, he's, he'll be all over you, you know, so, uh, sure, and, and Freddie was, Freddie was good, was good, and, uh, but he was like, you know, he didn't like, uh, you know, college educated students, this is 1982, going to college yeah. to play music wasn't quite, you know, like, respected amongst 
you know, his generation or guys older, you know. So um, um, well, my first gig was, of course, in the club uh, around the corner from where I had lived in Cologne. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, at the Subway Club. I used to live on Moltke Straße, right around the corner, literally 50 yards from the club. You know, I was mm -hmm. a regular uh, while I was living in, in, this is where I, I saw Ron with this band. This is where I saw Blakey. I saw Johnny Griffin. I saw everybody there, you know. Uh, What's his name? Chet Baker. Mm. Anybody would come through this. All the Vim Vic productions would come through the Subway Jazz Club, you know. So um, uh, and he's like, uh, yeah, this is Ira Cohen, you know. He's, he went to school at Berkeley. He's going to show you what he's learned in those two years or three <laughs> years, you know. So it's like people were like, you know, it's like a put on the spot, you know. Right, right. But it was incredible, you know. We On that tour, we're like... Um, we're like uh, uh, touring through Europe. At, and at one point, we have this gig at the uh, uh, Berlin Philharmonie, you know, 1985. And it's televised, live, you know, being recorded, you know, for posterity. And uh, and he's like, yeah, we're going to have some guests. And say, who is like, yeah, well, Dizzy and Woody Shaw. So <sighs> here I am. Straight out of college at the Berlin Philharmonie, where Karl Rajan had conducted, where I used to go every year, sneak in to see the Berlin Jazz Festival, where I saw, you know, Jaco with with Albert Mangelsdorf and and and, oh, and, uh, boy. and Alphonse Mouzon, that record. I, that, I was there. That is the that's prime Jaco before he joined yeah, Weather Report. That's uh, a great recording. And yeah. Weather Report with with. Alex Acuna, Chester Thompson, and and um, I've been men on bass. Alfonso uh, Johnson. Alfonso Johnson and yeah, uh, Acuna. Yeah. Alex Acuna. Alex Acuna. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is seventy six or seventy seven yeah. or something like that. I saw Mingus there. I uh, went up to him and he was he was great. And you know, I met John Batch. I saw Archie Sh uh, Sh uh, Gary Bartz with his band and. I mean, a whole bunch of people. I went there years in a row. Uh, and anyhow, so I'm on that stage, on that very stage. And uh, you, you can see it. It's it's on tape, you know. Uh, this is, is like, oh, what, uh, Mr. Gillespie, what are we going to play? Oh, you'll hear it. No, don't worry. So he comes in at Bernie's tune. And like I'm like, TV is on. Never played it, you know. The piano player knew it. It's so like D minor. So sure, D minor to E7, E minor, A7, back to D minor. And it's a bridge in B flat. So I have one chorus to learn the tune. And that, that's, you see, that's the experience. Yeah. You, and I listened to it. And it's like, oh yeah, after one chorus, you know, I had it, you know, I had heard the tune. So I was, I'm making it up. I'm harmonizing what I think comes. And sure enough, you know, I'm not far off, you know. So um, great. Yeah, start that, you know. So yeah, yeah learn, learning tunes. <laughs> yeah, and remembering them also. You know. That's incredible. Yeah. So how did, how did you get to work with Tony Williams? Was that through Billy, Billy Pierce? Uh. Billy Mulgrew okay. was, I guess, put a, maybe, I, I wasn't there, maybe uh, uh, Tony asked him, but what happened was... Robert Hurst was before you, right? Bassist Robert Rob, Hurst? Rob, yeah, yeah, Rob Hurst. And um, what happened was, do you remember the Saturday where... Well, Ira, you're starting to break up really bad fell pushed in front of a subway train 14 hello i'm sorry i didn't catch what you said your your picture is gone? your picture is frozen right now oh you're uh hold on okay we are back i'm uh here talking to ira coleman we had a few uh minor glitches but uh looks like we're all back and ira i was asking you about tony williams uh you had mentioned some of the band members billy pierce uh wallace rooney and uh, how you got uh in 
in the group uh, working with the late great uh, drummer Tony Williams. If you could tell us about that. Yes, I think we had left off where uh, 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 talking about the tragic accident that uh, Witty Shaw had. And uh, oh uh, yes. So there was a fundraiser to co cover his medical costs. I think mm -hmm. his arms had been severed. Yeah, because he was legally blind. They said that he fell down some steps onto like a train thing or something and, and got hit. I, I was reading something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Max Roach had left, sent a limousine to pick him up because at that time, this is what I heard. And I, I can't really vouch for it, but this is what perspires through the grapevine and uh, you know don't quant don't don't take it my word is if it's not correct but this is what i heard that um max i had sent a limo to f collect him from his parents place to come to the village vanguard or to a club where max was playing mm -hmm. and uh and woody um you know made us another stop somewhere and never got to the club and apparently that's when it happened you know um i don't know but it's uh, be it what it may it, it was tragic so uh, the musicians got together to to do a fundraiser for him and at that time you know it's funny i had said before you know that my mom had kind of you know why don't you go to mill jackson or max or you know, uh, Arthur Taylor, you know, they'll give you a gig. So I never did that, you know. Uh, uh, so what happened at that fundraiser, I had just started working with Art Taylor. He heard me and he said, you know, I'm putting a band together of young players. I want you to be part of it. So I got there and it was Jackie Terrasson. Uh, oh, yeah, the pianist. Yeah, Jackie yeah, Terrasson. Vince Herring and I. Just the four of us. We played mm -hmm. in his. He lives up. He lived up town, maybe 150th Street and somewhere not far from Showman's. And um, yeah, and um, um, so we we played. And he said, "I got a gig for us." You know, this is after one rehearsal. I remember we played "Hide Fly" and yeah, uh, "Little Melone" and uh, "The Old Stockholm" and stuff that he liked to play. Yeah. So he said, I got a gig for us. There's a fundraiser for at Sweetwaters, you know, there's a fundraiser for Woody, you know. So we went there and uh, there was two levels in the club. We played downstairs. I played a set and everybody was there, you know, like all musicians were there. So I'm coming up the stairs and um, um, I'm trying to remember. I forget his name. He used to go with uh, Vanessa Robin Rubin. He was heading bass player he had played with um with uh uh i think with um nancy wilson um paul west paul west he was you know di directing a series at the henry street Bar settlement he said he saw me coming up with my bass and said ara what are you doing i mean i need a bass player upstairs i need a bass player for the jam session so i'm like oh, okay okay i go up there and it's Bobby Henriquez on piano, Vernel Fournier, and uh, Onaji was playing the piano. Onaji Allen Gums. Some, yeah, for yeah. some tunes. And, and George Benson. Mm. So, so I'm playing up there, you know, call, they're calling tunes and we're playing. And and, um, and Milt Jackson is in, is in the audience. So at the end of the set, Mick Jackson comes up to me and said, "What are you doing next week? Bob Crenshaw can't do the, the 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 Village Vanguard with me. We, you know, do you want to play with me?" I said, "Yeah, of course, of course." So it's like I ended up at that gig playing a week with with uh, uh, Bags, with uh, Mickey Roker and mm. and uh, um, Michael Ladon, you know, on piano, and uh, and Bags and. Uh, so I just, and then on my way out, uh, Marianne Topper, who had actually booked Freddie Hubbard when I played with Freddie, said like, oh, Ira, uh, nice to hear you. I, I, I came in and I thought, I, I thought that was Ron Carter, but it can't be. I just, 
I just had a meeting with him not long ago. And what are you wow. doing this summer? Uh, uh, Tony is looking for, for a bass player. You know, I, you talk about being at the right spot. I mean, mm. the stars would just align for me at that. And at that time, you know, I had left uh, Betty Carter. Yeah. You know, um, I basically left Betty before she fired me. Because <laughs> I really thought she hated my guts, you know. So I remember the last night we played at Betty at, at, at uh, Fat Tuesdays. You know, it was a place where I couldn't even stand. I mean, oh, you see my bass here in the back, you know, one of my bases. Right. It's, it's the same bass. The same you know, bass. So. Yeah, I, I, I went on tour with Betty Carter for six weeks and I came and paid my whole cash, my whole tour money to, to get this bass. I, wow. had, I, I had seen it at Gages. It reminded me of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the bass that John Clayton was playing is a big orchestral German bass and and the one that uh, um, uh, a very similar bass uh, uh, Dave Holland was playing a big yeah. bass you know with the, the full size string lengths on a seven eighths body you know so when I played with uh, uh, with with Betty at Fat Tuesdays the ceiling where I was standing was so low that the bass didn't even fit in without the peg out mm. you know. So I had to play the bass for a whole week, like leaning like this, because she didn't allow bass players to sit. She oh, said, wow. when, as a bass player, when you sit, your time gets lazy. And she's right. There's something about being unstable, being anchored on your feet, having to balance the bass, which keeps, keeps you. You can't fall asleep on that. You, you fall away. You, you know, it's like, you know, you're more alert when you're standing than when, if you're sitting, you know. You won't fall asleep if you're standing on the, unless you're doing something wrong, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and you start nodding. But um, so she didn't like bass players to sit, you know, and I, I understood. I respected that, you know, I, I stand most of the time myself. I like it makes me play different differently. Uh, so um, uh, how did I get to that? Um, so, yeah, at the end of the. That was the last week I went to her and I could see her like, you know, I was quitting and there'd been some friction and, and, and I was basically getting a acid indigestion from being on the gig. I was so <laughs> hard, you know, it was hard. It was hard, yeah. you know, to have somebody yell at you all the time and humiliate you in, in public in front of the audience, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I became really good friends with Betty once I stopped working with her, you know. I uh -huh. saw her, we hung out together, and, you know, and I remember the last time I saw her was basically two months before sh she passed away. She was in Europe, in Nice. We hung out together, and she was like, come by the house, and I never got to do it. She got so sick, you know, so so suddenly, you know. And uh, But to make a long story short, I think, Betty was the kind of person that needs a daily confrontation to get her juices going, you know. Interesting. <laughs> Are you some, slow? Some measure of controversy and so on, you know. You know, you know. We we would listen to music like Train and stuff, and like Winard and I and Stephen Scott, and she would come in and say, "Yeah, you know." Jimmy Garrison wasn't playing anything and Train wasn't playing anything <laughs> later. And, you know, she just needed to, you know, vent some negative stuff just to get her juices going. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you know, playing with different band leaders and different people, you, you learn characters, you know, yeah. you know, you learn to appreciate things and you, you know, we're not perfect you know we have good qualities and not so good qualities and you know we're here to make things work you know we, you're on the bandstand to make music together so you know a lot of ego and a lot of stuff has to go by side when you're on when you, when you're making music you know you need to it's a communal effort it's not always exactly. very democratic 
like Sting s- says, you know, music is not a democratic process. You know, at the end, there's a band who tells you what to do. But, you know, within these constraints, you know, he is the prime example of bringing out the best out of his musicians because he treats them with respect, with a lot of, and, 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 and rewards them uh, very uh, generously and uh, is a total gentleman, you know. When you play with him, he wants to take your abilities and work them in, in into his project and 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 make the music shine through it that's why he loves jazz musicians people who are, have an open mind because he's an open minded musician you know so uh you know you're always in the best hotels you fly private planes uh when it makes sense when it's cheaper than 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 you know flying a whole entourage of 11 12 p first class you know uh um and you know he has so many things to do and and so we stay in the same hotel with him we fly fly the same plane and he's you know when we p- rehearse with him we are in his house you know and like kings treated like kings eating you know uh, organic food from the from from the estate you know and breaking for tea and scone in front of the and the fireplace and so on. So it's uh, how can you not bring your best to to the table when you're treated like that? Yeah, you were you were with <laughs> him uh, when he was doing what the Symphonicity tour, I yeah. believe. And yeah. uh, I think didn't he? I think uh, someone uh, you guys had a mutual friend that I guess liked your playing, and he referred you to Sting, or he wanted I guess he wanted to, you to play on one of Sting's songs, and then it ended up turning into you playing what uh, electric bass on like several songs or something like that. I think I was reading. Yeah, what actually what happened was uh, the producer is a friend of mine. Yeah, uh, uh, Robert Saden. Uh, That's it. That's the name. Yeah, he's a friend and he's he's been a mentor to me for over 20 years now. Wow. And I was playing with 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 Tony and he called me and he said, you know, he said, you know, I'm, I'm Robert Saden. Uh, I have a recording that I want to do with Kathleen Battle. Um, I like your tone. Yeah. He said he liked my tone. Yeah. Said, Amazing, Ira. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking as I'm talking to you, you work with so many people, you know, you mentioned Kathleen Battle. You also work with Jesse Norman as well, you know, comping behind these, uh, these incredible vocalists, but, um, you know, uh, Dee Dee, of course, I've brought your name up to Dee Dee before and she just smiled at me. You worked with her for a number of years. You were the musical director uh, for her. And Dee Dee, Dee Dee's incredible. I mean, a career of over 50 years. I mean, what was it like working with her? Well, you know, she's made out of the same stock as as Betty. Yeah. She's a strong woman. And and excuse my my english no, it's okay she went through some shit in life you know and, oh i know i know and she excelled i mean she uh, uh, look where she is now i mean she's you know the she's the last one of that generation you she know? really is yeah you know, Betty really is is. not there carmen mccray is not there nancy um, wilson just passed away a few years ago so yeah you know, she is, she is the link, you know, she started off like in 1967 going mm-hmm. to Russia mm-hmm. with, uh, with, um, Mel Lewis and Thad Jones in that band. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, she, she's just, uh, you know, she's just she's great, scene, man. You know, I was going to yeah. ask you, were you in that band with her and she had pianist Edsel Gomez? Yes. Yes. Okay. I did, okay. I did two projects with uh i did like a latin project kind of latinesque project and then yeah billy holiday project yeah that's Edsel. right so and we did um the music of mali red earth you know, oh we she and to, i we had went a, to bamako you know oh and she and i had it you need to see my interview with i did a, a 90 minute need, interview with dd Dee Dee and we talked about all it. of this stuff yeah she's she's something else. she's going to be here in a couple of weeks but I, I brought your name up to her before and she just her face just lit up us as ira you know I, I, yeah i had the best time and that i did a french prog- uh, project with her j'ai deux amours yeah um you know i know about that yeah. guitar mm-hmm. and percussion 
Yeah. And before that, I did a court vial with 11 musicians on stage, you know, wow. eight, nine musicians, you know, three horns and uh, like four horns. Uh, wait a minute. Trumpet, trombone. Yeah. Nicolas Folmer on trumpet, Denis Lelou on trombone, Daniel Scagnapieco on tenor and alto, Dede Sicarelli on on drums, Thierry Elias on on piano, uh, maybe, yeah, this is before Minino got I on percussion, maybe he was on that too, and myself and her. So it's like six or seven musicians, you know, mm. so... Uh, and by the way, that was then that I came up with that little bass you see in the back. That little yeah, bass. yeah. Uh, that's the Czech ease. That was my answer to nine eleven. I started playing with her in two thousand one. Two thousand one. After, after nine eleven. Uh, I was watching some footage of you guys. Yeah. yeah, it was impossible to travel with a bass at that time. Mm. You know, it used to be you went to LaGuardia and you slipped like a twenty into the sky cap pocket. And he would just put your bass on, you know, maybe you play one overcharge of like a hundred bucks if you were unlucky. After 9-11, it was like double overweight, double oversized. So every time you flew, it was like 500 bucks you had to pay for it because suddenly they realized you couldn't do things uh, on the on the on street curb. And they realized, oh, wow, this is all this money coming in through luggages, luggage, you know. <laughs> so wow. really it was like what are we gonna do you know like i i can't with that band you know we can't have this overhead and i said you know i got this idea i'm gonna create a base because i had built a base like that back in before moving to the states i had a friend who was a luthier and i put a base together like a fashion a flat body flat top flat uh flat back base with a detachable neck you know this is like early 80s when i just mm -hmm. started playing because i'm quite handy with my hands it comes you know seeing my mom like doing jewelry and fiddling around and being in germany like my mom's friends were engineers there so they at 12 they showed showed me how to 12 to take my everything off my 12 speed bike apart i disassembled cleaned it repainted and put back together i mean these guys were amazing they gave me a confidence to take apart a watch or so um so actually i w i was going to become an electronics engineer i did an apprenticeship of two years after high school you know mm. before i discovered music you know i was uh, incredible i was gonna be become the equivalent of what a tv repairman is but for the industry you know repairing uh. oscilloscopes uh, os oscilloscopes and you know, like, so that's, that's what I was studying. And, but, you know, <laughs> but I know yeah. I can only, I can barely recite the, the, the Ohm law, you know? <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. you I, know, I, yeah. I've forgotten everything, but I still like to I fiddle around. You know, I, I built uh, out of separate parts. I built like th three electric bases through, through oh, wow. uh, in, in doing my, um, doing COVID, you know, now, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you when you were playing with Sting, normally you don't, uh, I guess, perform playing an electric bass. Uh, but I guess you had no. to do that for one of his shows. I think I was reading something like you said, sometimes it would it was a little challenging because uh, you had these, I guess, other bassists or something like that with you. But when you went out on tour with him, um, I, I was just reading. I used the little bass. The little on bass. Tour. Okay. Okay. But on yeah. two or three tunes, he was like, you know what, electric bass would be good there. Do you play? I said, you know, I've had one since 1977, but I don't perform on it. Yeah. Why did I say that? You know, like a couple <laughs> of weeks later, that was one of his signature basses. St Sting wanted you my... to pull it out and play it, didn't he? Oh, so, man. you know, Sting is like, uh, Sting is like, is one of us. You know, he's there every sound check. Yeah. Um, we jam it before the orchestra come, you know, I mean, we did like 200 concerts, I think with, with wow. Symphonicity across two years or 150, I don't know exactly, but a whole pile of concerts. First with a, a the Royal um, Philharmonic Concert Orchestra yeah. um, from England, uh, who would travel with us. And then 
we had uh, uh, then the, the, the second year was basically we had a, a rehearsal conductor go ahead every town that we or city would play and have a rehearsal about a week before we would come. And then showtime at 4 o'clock, we are all out there. Uh, mm. And uh, at 5, the orchestra comes in. We run through the whole program, and then 8, we play the concert. You know, That's, that's so, amazing. Wow. And every one of these times, Sting is there. And when you go into his, his dressing room, he's playing his lute or he's playing his guitar. He's writing something. He's he's the happiest on tour playing yeah. music, you know. He, he practices all the time, writes stuff. He he's a thinking musician. I mean, he's such an inspiration. You know, first of all, he's totally eloquent and yeah, uh, um, and just interested about any kind of music. Um, it's just like. Uh, yeah, he's 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 just like a total gentleman and a, yeah. a great and truly a great artist who has just chosen maybe like pop music or to to make a living and to be able to finance all his other dreams, you know. So he wrote <laughs> this play called um, uh, The Last Ship, which is basically uh, the protagonist is like the prodigal son who comes back yeah. to uh, Newcastle to you know this city where he grew up you know and and uh, and finds out that his father had passed away and that his high school or his childhood uh, sweetheart has married somebody that you know uh, uh who is much older and so it's this and then you throw in a a, a an irish priest who who helps uh out of work uh, shipyard workers to finish an unfinished ship and sail it through the world and spread the message. So it, it's a great story. And he wrote uh, with some collaborators, but mainly he was the impetus between behind everything, behind, behind writing. He's, he's a prolific behind musician, the, man. The songs, the lyrics, everything. And um, Rob Matthews was, was uh, writing a lot with him and just putting putting his ideas into a Broadway kind of you know Broadway kind of setting you know that's it's very formulated you know and, uh, and amazing that's really and amazing it's still alive you know it's it, yeah. it had a short run on Broadway and it, it just mm -hmm. started like at the wrong time and at the time of the year where it's you know and it's you need a million dollars in revenue to a week to to keep something on Broadway, and it's it's tough, you know. So yes, it definitely a lot is. Of people, it's it's Broadway is littered with with carcasses and skeletons of people who tried, you know. And I mean, what's his name? Paul Simon tried at one time a play, and you know, I mean, it's it's not your name which will. You know, if you've got a family coming from Midwest nowadays, they want they want to see people hanging from wires or flying through the air. You know, so <laughs> that's something. You've also uh, worked with uh, Herbie Hancock too. I was uh, you on Gershwin's World, uh, his recording. You all you work with, uh, I guess him and along with uh, Wayne Shorter, both of those guys. And of course, yes. Wayne Wayne is a genius. I mean, guys, well, probably the most prolific composer or jazz composer living now. Uh, but uh, what was it like working with Herbie, man? Well, I got the first time I got to play with Herbie was standing in for Stanley Clark to do like a uh, a. I had met Herb, Herbie in the seventies. I used to go up to him. You know, I saw the band with the um, not the one I missed the one with my. I'm at the VSOP the group that they had. Yeah, or even in seventy-seven, you know, secrets, you know that record with the. Uh, I have Andy secrets. Levi and yeah, I have that. Watson and I have that you know, Paul Jackson, of course. He was Paul another Jackson. one of my big er heroes. On electric bass, my two heroes are Anthony and Paul Jackson, you know. Uh, but Paul, I mean, yeah, ridiculous. Always, you know. And uh, um, so I had met him a few times, you know. And But, uh, um, and I got to, uh, actually, I saw him with, with, Miles in 1963. I was seven years old in in Antibes, that live in Europe. Oh, I, I was there at that concert. I in, think that's in 64, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow! 
Yeah, That's incredible. 63, I think it is. Yeah. The 63? Yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, my, my mom took me. It was like 20 miles, 20 Ks from my house. You know? That's incredible, so Ira. She took my me gosh. to see Ray Charles there. She took me to see Miles. She took me to uh, Les McCann, walked all the way home. You know, and, uh, Herbie Lewis, from, who was playing with Les McCann and, you know, worked all. I mean, music, when musicians were on the Riviera, either playing in Antibes, we, this was before Nice, you know, the great, yeah. the Grand Parade du Jazz. Uh, jazz à Juin, you know, in Juin les Pains, in Antibes. The musicians would come to the house or, you know, like um, Navy personnel who would like dock on, for the, uh, um, for the Navy, either in Toulon, you know, uh, they would make their way to my dad's house, you know, it was like almost like you know, back in the day. You went down south, and it's who is there, you know. You, you yeah. You always look out for who is the who is the brother around, you know. So, you know, so the house was always full of people, and it was a big house with guest rooms. So, everybody was staying there, you know. And yeah. or people, musicians would come to Paris, and then you, oh, let's go to the French Riviera. Who is there? Oh, Walter and Torin are down there. Let's go down. I mean. I mean, uh, 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 Mingus wrote a tune for my parents. It's called Blues for Waltz Torn. Yeah, I know that it, tune. It, it's, it's on oh, forget uh, your dad. Midnight, wow. midnight at Noon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. and That's so, incredible, man. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was, so the house was always full. So, you know, it's always about, you know, who was around. So it's, uh, yeah. You know, Ira, I was just looking at something. I have, uh, man, I recorded it years ago. It's, I think it's from the early 90s. It's with you, Tony Williams, and Herbie Hancock. You guys were on this TV show, and Herbie was being interviewed. Tony was being interviewed, and you guys were playing one of my favorite songs, and you guys played it also when you were in the quintet, Sister Cheryl. I've always liked that song with you guys. That's one of Tony's best tunes. And yeah. he was he was also developing as a composer, uh, even more so because, I mean, of course, the stuff that he wrote with the quintet, but one of his last recordings, Wilderness, I thought was a masterpiece. He had really developed as a composer. But, uh, you know, speaking of um, even some of the band members, uh, last year, of course, we lost Wallace. And I was with Wallace Rooney two months uh, before he passed. Uh, Because I was about to start my show and we were talking about doing an interview. And he said, oh, definitely. And then, boom, two months later, he was gone from Uh, COVID, you know. And, uh, of course, Mulgrew, we lost him many years ago. Mulgrew was one of the greatest pianists of his generation. I think about him and James Williams and some of those other guys. Mulgrew was just a wonderful guy. I've talked to so many people, Ira, about Mulgrew. And it's just their their face just lights up, you know, talking about him. Now, I also wanted to... um, Ask so, you, uh, uh, let me. Uh, so that's sure. that was the, the that program you saw. That's the first time I'm I played with uh, oh, yeah, with okay. Herbie. And okay, Tony. I mean, uh, it's, uh, Tony calls me up. It's like I, I was in his band at that time. What are you doing, you know, next uh, Saturday or so? I said, Well, I'm playing Bla- Bradley's with with Mulgrew. So I had to call Mulgrew and said, You know, Mulgrew, Tony called me, you know, I'm playing and who is on piano, Herbie, <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. I got out there, and uh, that was the first time I had played um, with with. Uh, so, can you imagine playing a trio? With that was great, man. They showed yeah. it on uh, they showed it on BET at the time, and I think it was like the yeah. early nineties. And I uh, I still it's watch BBC, it. But... Yeah, that yeah, was that, yeah. BBC. And yeah, actually, that was that was great. It, yeah, it, it was Stanley. I think was supposed to do it, and he, he was either not ab- available, and and Tony said. Uh, yeah, I well, use my bass player, you know. So you see that that was Tony. You know, with Tony, I think I missed one no, one concert. I missed one concert when I played with him, you know. Uh um and it's uh Brian Bromberg. Uh, you were back and forth too. The amazing thing is when you were playing with Tony, you're also playing with Monty Alexander. Yes. You were like yes, back and like Monty? Yeah. I, I w- went to Monty, and Monty was great about that because I said, Monty, you know, I'm in this band with Tony Williams. This will, ha- this has priority. So if you want to uh, have a, f- uh, a regular trio, I-, I won't really be able to do that. I don't want, mm. I don't want to put you in that situation. He said, No, no, no. I-, I like to play with other people. No problem. Tell me whenever you're ready. 
whenever you you're available I'll call you if you can do it I would love to have you so that it was a great th those were two different great different poles you know yeah. of, of music so uh, yeah so uh, after playing with trio um, um, at one point again my my friend Robert Sa Sadin was going to play with producing a record f for uh, um, for her be called Gershwin's world you know or the world around Gershwin his contemporaries so you got music by Ravel you got music by um, other composers and other uh, uh, and, and, and music which influence Gershwin also mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. I, I played on I think it ain't necessarily so and then Herbie kept asking for me so I ended up I think on 11 tracks of it you know wow. on that record that's a great recording too man I, I tell you that chick is yeah, on that he's got yeah yeah yeah, and I think Joni Mitchell's on there too, and she Joni, Joni Mitchell? Mitchell. Yeah, I I, uh, I overdubbed those two tracks with with Joni Mitchell. And, oh wow! And I think Summertime doesn't have drums, and you know when you when you play with with Herbie, the way he is so fluid, and you know it's 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 a uh, it's a different kind of way to find. You know, so I, I listen to it and I try to be inspired and try to think that I was there at, at the. You you were at the right place at the right time. I wanted to ask you. You're also an educator, and uh, I know that you've been teaching for a while, and recently have taken this uh, position. You're in Montreal now. Tell me about that. Uh, you seem to have a, a love and a passion for teaching, and you seem to be good at it too. I was watching a couple of videos with you with some students, man, and they were just really focused and locked in and you were you know playing some bass lines but tell me about uh just the the, uh, the teaching aspect is that something that you're, you're passionate about that you really enjoy doing yes yes i do i i I've, i you know i i i try to share I, I i look at my students as being my audience now yeah you know, as you want i'm just sharing my knowledge my my um happiness my joy for the music and also my experience so um, mm. i i'm currently actually this is montreal you know i just moved here yeah ago, and i today was my first day at school <laughs> get out of here are you serious a, that's amazing full-time associate professor on tenure track wow. well yeah so I, I gotta i gotta thank you man for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and have a conversation that means a lot you know and i, I wish you all the best because i know you know having you there they're probably tickled to death you know ira coleman wow you know as professor that, well, that, that, I, that i must say i the impression that i have i've been here for a month you know I've, okay you know you need a work permit you need a social security number bank account right. find an apartment you know try to find your your robes write the syllabi and you know and all that stuff that the fun stuff as a teacher you know but uh um um i i find people very open-minded i've only experienced like like really helpfulness from my colleagues i've had like already uh jam sessions here with all my my colleagues and uh you know during their vacation they just called me up and we went to school and played together I, i've done the gig uh, last weekend at the local club here so it's it it's very nice it's very inclusive you know it's um and the the, the town is a little more laid back which is i think is nice my age I, i'm 65 now so i'm you look great man you look I'm, good I'm, I, I'm on Medicare. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like I just got here a while yeah. ago. You know, so. Yeah, man, that, that's great. I was just going to ask you about uh, any future projects or recordings that we may be hearing from Ira Coleman. Uh, you know, what what's next for you? Are you working on anything right now, uh, Matt? You well, know, will I, we? You know, like a few people that I know. I mean, I don't know if Peter Washington has a rec recording on on his own or you know um we've I, i'd like to do that at one time but i i 
I'm mainly a sideman. Let's put it like this. Um, I have the luxury of preparing music and playing with great players, and they deal, the bandleys deal with the hassle of making sure that everybody's on time, that the money is right, that right. Blah, 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 all this stuff. And all these years, I've basically been a team player, I've been supportive, and, um, you know, I haven't really done my own thing. But now I'm at a point where I think um, it doesn't really mean that I, I, I want to have the pressure to have it commercially yeah. successful or something like that, you know. So I'm, I'm taking my time, you know, I'm the right time. Uh, so I need to settle in into this new position. And uh, the school is very supportive. They're really, you know, part of 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 your your uh, conditions for tenure track is to keep uh, it's a research or uh, university so as a being in the performance department it means you know being active you know being you encouraged to to play and to do different projects so everything that i do you know i try to do as much as possible you know and to schedule my classes in such a way that it won't interfere and so it's a little bit of a juggling thing but it's possible and it's encouraged and not looked down you know as right. in, in most american universities where you like you're like as an adjunct if you have one day a week and you you can't go on tour and you get you know they don't want you to be you know to send a sub in or somebody to cover for you and <laughs> like you know how you're supposed to make a living from that you know so Indeed, and indeed. They're quite hip, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, uh, Ira, I want to thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk today. It has been an honor and a pleasure sharing the space with you and just having great conversation. The stories alone, oh boy, I mean, just learning so much about you and, and uh, you know, your family. It's just incredible, incredible. Well, listen, hang on. I'm about to close out the show. I mean, you've heard it from the great Ira Coleman. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. Thank you.